What words come to mind when you hear dispute management? Procedure, resolution process, tribunal, economic development. And what are some of the underlying industries that use dispute management? Construction, for instance, insurance, maritime, trade, investment, sports, and intellectual property are just a few. The world is a connected village. Cross-border engagement is unavoidable. Consequential disputes, conflicts in one sphere or another are inevitable. And the public good is best served by enabled capacity in the field of disputes, conflicts management. Hello and welcome to the Dispute Management in the New World podcast, a bi-weekly conversation series with Dr. Christopher Malcolm, dispute management professional, academician, international legal consultant, and entrepreneurial visionary. My name is Roxy Nickel, and joining me is my co-host, I'm Anika Nelson. Thank you for joining us for this introductory podcast brought to you by the JDIC, protecting deposits for you and me. Welcome back, Dr. Malcolm. Thank you, Anika, and thank you, Roxine, You're for welcome. still being with me. In the first um, episode, we spoke about your involvement with the JAIAC and other institution building activities. One of those that we didn't get to talk about was your street law involvement. You, you want to give us an idea what that is about? It started out as a program at Georgetown University in 1972. Professor Ed O'Brien started it then, and it has since spread to a number of countries worldwide including to South Africa. Now, in or about 2015, thereabouts, mm -hmm. I then, through my contact with Professor David McCoy Mason at the KwaZulu-Natal University in South Africa, was able to bring street law to the Caribbean. And what then is street law and how does it function? Street law is not the law of the street. I think we can get <laughs> beyond that. What it is, is an initiative that is developed to get persons to a better understanding, legal literacy in a sense, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. and to help persons to understand how they relate to the law, how the law impacts them, and how they should better function in their societies by reference to it. So what it does is that it helps persons at all levels. It's community oriented, and it's really intended as an initiative where we're able to accept the law for what it is, because we can't change that, and then try to do, as we say, take it from the cathedral to the marketplace. You try to demystify it so the average Joe, the average person on the street can understand what the law is about. Because one of the problems with law generally, and I speak as a lawyer for the moment, is that very often persons think of the law and they think of this great mystery mm -hmm. and of something where only persons who understand all sorts of jargon and so on can relate to. But sadly, we function in an environment where the first thing we learn is that ignorance of the law is no excuse. So if ignorance of the law is no excuse, it behoves us to ensure that we know what the law is. And those of us who understand it well enough also have a responsibility, I believe, to try to ensure that as many persons as are possible learn the law. And the learning of the law, in my view, because this is so all-encompassing and all-embracing, should start from as early as is possible and should become critical to the development of every child, of every person in the community. And it is, that is what street law is about. In most jurisdictions where it has been developed and, and, and utilized, mm -hmm. street law typically focuses on rule of law and human rights issues. Mm -hmm. But in our own context, and perhaps because of my own leaning in the area of economic development, I recognized and thought that the contribution that I could make, which is really novel, this is the novelty of the programs mm -hmm. that we have brought to the Caribbean, should be one which was more focused on the area of economic rights and development. So for that reason, our program focuses on questions related to contracting, intellectual property rights, and so on. And you may ask, why intellectual property rights? Mm -hmm. And there's a really short and perhaps good story to that. In or about 1993, I was on one of the high streets in London. Could have been Regent Street or one or the other. Mm -hmm. And at the time, they were launching or relaunching, as the case may be, easy jeans across Europe. And the song that was being used in this effort was Easy Snapping, which is a song that Theophilus Beckford did. And in recent years, I think I've also heard it being used as a song to advertise Corona Bear. It dawned upon me 
to recall that Bia Fulos Beckford, notwithstanding that this song was being used in such a significant way where there are clearly lots of money being earned from its usage, mm -hmm. was not himself a beneficiary of it. And for those of us who know the story of Bia Fulos Beckford well enough, we know that he died a pauper. Mm -hmm. And there are so many others who have gone down that road. And in the context of the Caribbean, I always maintain that the real area of comparative advantage that we have is in the area of our creative industries, mm -hmm. our intellectual property and things related to that. And so if we're going to say that is what it is, we need to find a way to ensure that people benefit the most that they can from what they develop and from what is inherently ours. We have to remember this, that it is not the nature of what you produce that determines how well you benefit from it. It's very often the nature of the legal protections that you have, particularly where intellectual property is concerned, because your works are being exploited. And it's a question of how you have contractual relationships in place and what the nature of those are that will determine the level of royalties and other payments you get from them. So what we then have to do, in my view, was then to craft a program with those sorts of things at the core. So the idea of Street Law Caribbean is to help persons in Jamaica and across the Caribbean, and we have done work across the Caribbean, to get to a better understanding of the nature of the societies that they live in, the nature of the democracies that we function in, the legal arrangements that guide them and by which they are subjected, regardless of whether they want to think so or not, mm. and to help them then to use and leverage the legal system better in support of their own individual economies which then has a spin-off effect for the overall economy. So if we do it well, mm -hmm. and we get people to a better understanding of law, then you will have the economies flourishing. And for the lawyers who may think that this is a way of sort of depriving them of their goodwill and so on, it is not. And in fact, in those countries globally where street law thrives, lawyers are the greatest supporters of these programs. Why? Because they recognize that if persons become more aware of their legal rights, they will in turn get more work to do. Mm -hmm. So we want persons to understand that this is not that we're giving legal advice to anybody. Mm -hmm. We're giving legal sensitization to persons in the hope that they will better understand, very importantly, when they need to get a lawyer. Mm. Because you, that give is us critical. an idea of a practical way in which you are doing this within Jamaica. Well, in the context of Jamaica, one of the initiatives we've worked with there's a Jamaica Business Development Corporation in the context of Jamaica, and they have a mobile, they've had a mobile business clinic that they've been using across Jamaica. And we have worked with them across the length and breadth of Jamaica in those mobile clinics to help in the sensitization program of the SME sector, the small and medium enterprises sector. Mm -hmm. We have done critical work with them. Elsewhere in the region, we have also worked with other entities, including in the context of Belize, where we have worked to help to introduce a street law curriculum in some schools there. And these are broad-based objectives. Of course, these things require proper support for them to continue mm -hmm. because we do all of what we do pro bono. Mm. We bring our legal acumen, we bring the skill sets that we have, and we say to persons, put the basic arrangements in place and we will work with you to ensure that this happens. But of course, we are always limited by the resources available to us, but we have a grand ambition to work closely to ensure in our context that we can get it in as many schools as possible, in as many community centers as possible, mm -hmm. in as many churches as possible, so we can have persons being more aware. And I go back to something else that we said earlier, that if you think about it, if persons are more aware of their legal rights, instead of chopping each other up, mm -hmm. they then understand that there's a legal process. I don't have to be afraid of the courts. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be afraid of legal institutions because I know they're, they're designed to assist me. And I can therefore leverage them to help me to deal with the issues that I may have, which helps me also to deal with peace and security. Excellent. Wow. Dr. Malcolm, you've worked across the region. And in regard to dispute management, do you see any countries in the region that are at an advantage or a disadvantage as it relates to dispute management? Can you speak to that? Well, the, there are some countries, Jamaica included, where the infrastructure that we have in place, for example, in 2017, we updated our Arbitration Act. And if you look at other countries across the region, the British Virgin Islands updated theirs prior to that. And so there are some countries that have taken more significant steps to move there. Jamaica, again, in 2019, we were first day signatories mm -hmm. to, the, to, the, to the mediation, the Singapore Mediation Convention. Mm -hmm. 
So there are countries that have been moving along that path. The question of advantage, however, is not so much a question of the infrastructure that you have in place. It's a question of how well the infrastructure has been used yeah. and how well persons are aware that they can leverage and use these, the extent to which our court systems, for example, are working lockstep with alternative methods for resolving disputes. So that the courts, as you had mentioned at some point, are not the, the first resort mm -hmm. to dealing with disputes, but in fact a complementary process mm -hmm. that persons get to after they have exhausted the other, other, other things. So the, in short answer to your question, while I think we have gone the length and breadth and we've gone across the region, we have done a lot of capacity building initiatives and so on, and there are persons who have become more and more aware of how it is that you can use dispute management more creatively, we still have a situation where we have not got to the point where we should get yet. And it is difficult, quite frankly, without statistics mm -hmm. and without data. You know, in this day and age, we understand the value of data mm -hmm. more than ever. Yes. And unfortunately, we haven't had the sort of data created which can give the short and clear answer to that as to who are the persons who are well ahead. But what I would say is that there are some jurisdictions where persons have built economies around the legal process, mm -hmm. which by extension includes a legal, a dispute management system. So if you think, for example, you hear about the British Virgin Islands or Cayman Islands and so on, and people think about them as financial services centers. Mm -hmm. But at the core, you know, what they have are legal service centers. Because if you think about an offshore center in and out of courts, it is not reliant on money and all the other things that are there per se. It is reliant on legal technology being developed, which allow people to effectively develop instruments relating to the management of the trust, instruments relating to reinsurance, instruments relating to aircraft lease financing, and so on and so forth. And all of these things are legal in terms of how they're developed. And once you start talking about those and talking about people moving across, then you're also in the same breath recognizing something else, that their court systems are becoming more and more mature in the area of commercial law, and that they're also getting more and more exposed to and, 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 and clearly in a position where they're using arbitration and these mechanisms a lot more because of the needs of their clients and by extension, we respond to needs of clients. So the short is you may find that some jurisdictions are a little ahead in terms of what appears to be the stability of their legal services systems. And that by extension, you could say, well, perhaps they're ahead, but I'm saying that we really don't have the statistics mm -hmm. to be able to make that mm -hmm. grand comparison. Okay. Um, for those, because we always assume that nobody knows, tell us a little bit about what the JAIC offers. Somebody's tuning in, they want to know. The JAIC offers a full suite of dispute resolution services. So what it is, is that it has been established with its own rules, rules related to arbitration, mediation, whatever else. And persons can subscribe to it as an institution, subscribe to the rules. Mm -hmm. And then if they have disputes, they can register those disputes there to have them administered. So when they come there, what are the specific services that they may have? They may come in, for example, with a matter where they want to have it resolved by arbitration or by mediation or a number of other things can be used to mm -hmm. do that. But that is really an end point and not a beginning because the JAIC recognizes as well that persons can only come into an institution for use of its services where there are contractual arrangements between parties that enable that to happen. So the JAIAC, of course, has to ensure that it is critically involved in a sensitization program as well, where it helps to get persons to understand that we exist and that there are these mechanisms available that you can use. But the short answer to get back more directly is that the JAIAC is established to serve the needs of parties, and it is flexible enough to deal with those needs in accordance with what the parties require. And in fact, quite frankly, as, as the other thing to bear in mind when you deal with dispute management is getting back to the one size fits all doesn't really work. And very often, somebody may come and think that, well, mediation may work. But the truth is, you have to look and try to understand all the mechanisms that may be available to then determine what is most appropriate. Mm -hmm. And for an institution to be trying to serve the needs of parties, it must also ensure that it has the capacity to serve the discriminating, in a good way, word, mm -hmm. yes, needs of clients, our customers, our parties, 
by reference to what the needs of their particular case is from time to time. So the JIC is flexible enough to be able to okay. do that. So say, for instance, somebody is has found out about the, the JAIC and they're already on the other side of it in terms of it's being dealt with legally. Can that be transferred, for want of a better word, for you to, they've now decided they want to go that way, whatever works in terms of your services. Is that a possibility? Always is, and I'll tell you why. Every matter which is in the nature of a, what we call a civil matter, mm -hmm. one person suing another mm -hmm. and so on, those are considered to be civil, as distinct from criminal law matters. They are always party, party proceedings. Mm -hmm. And because it's a party, party proceedings, the parties can mutually by agreement, at any point, opt out of a court system, even if they've already commenced matters in a court. Okay. They can always opt out of it to go into some other process which they agree to contractually, right? The other thing, of course, is that there are instances, even within our court system, where you have the court referring matters into mediation, and in some instances into arbitration and so on as well. So even the court system itself allows for, par for parties to even if it is in a temporary way, mm -hmm. go into another process which can assist them to resolve their disputes. And even if not resolved completely, assist them to minimize the areas of conflicts that they have, which will make it easier for the court process of resolution to go through litigation in a more, in a more seamless way. Okay. Alternative dispute resolution and arbitration are, I presume, two of the services offered through the JAIAC? Well, alternative dispute resolution really is traditionally considered to be mm -hmm. anything that is alternative to litigation in national courts. The court system is part of our system of government, right? Mm -hmm. We have a, a democracy that says you have three arms of government, mm -hmm. the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary, critical arm. Now, under our constitutional arrangement, the court has what we call, gives you what we call a constitutional right of access to the court. Mm -hmm. The court is established as that mechanism that you're able to go to to have your disputes resolved, right? Constitutional recognition for that. Anything else that you do is by necessity opting out of your constitutional right of access. And the only way you can do that is by reference to what is a contractual process. So if we think alternative dispute resolution, then we're saying it's alternative to your constitutional right of access process. So if it is alternative to that and everything else is contractual, it means that every form of ADR that you're going to go into, be it arbitration, mediation, conciliation, whatever, arises by reference to an agreement between the parties, which is in the nature of a contract. So you then have a contractual right of access to all these processes. Mm -hmm. So what the what, what, what the JAIC does is that we are not a court. Mm -hmm. So it is not possible to give you a constitutional right of access to the JAIC. What you will then have is a contractual right of access, which is the alternative. There is, however, if we think about ADR in a more, in a more progressive way, some persons may think, mm -hmm. is that ADR is traditionally, as I said, considered to be alternative dispute resolution. And some persons treat it to, consider, uh, to include arbitration, others don't. And that is not, that's a moot point we don't have to get too much into. But there's another approach, though, that some persons take, which is to consider ADR as being short for appropriate dispute resolution, where the appropriate processes include litigation in, in, in some instances. So you have a range of options that are available to you. And the question is, what is most appropriate given the circumstances that you're in mm -hmm. to resolve your dispute? So what it then comes down to is that the important thing, and that is why capacity building is so important again, you need to get persons to understand the nature of dispute resolution processes. And by understanding those processes, they can then understand what is most appropriate for them in one situation or another. And if you do that, you then understand that there are some instances where mediation may be the best thing available to you. There are others where arbitration may be. But there are also others, because it's contractual, where you may find that it is a combination of several different processes. So you may find, for example, that if person A and person B are in a conflict, you may say to them, well, why don't you try good offices, which is talk to your pastor to see if your pastor can help you, or try some other low-lying method which doesn't involve an adversarial process. If that fails, you may then think of going to mediation. 
if that fails, you may then think of going to arbitration. Mm -hmm. So you can have a graded or a tiered system that persons are able to devise. And again, it comes back to an understanding of what's available, an understanding of the flexibility that these processes enable you to have, and then determining what works best in any given circumstance, ultimately to do what? Not to satisfy the needs of any institution or any third party neutral or so on, but to satisfy the needs of the parties. Because ultimately ADR or, or the court system mm -hmm. is supposed to be party centered, trying to resolve the disputes of others, not in any way of trying to create goodwill for myself or for anybody else, but to ensure that we try as best as is possible to have persons leaving the process thinking, I may not have got all I wanted, but I feel that the process treated me fairly and I'm able to move on. Now, the JAIC has always hosted events and stuff online, but in light of COVID-19, how has it uh, reshaped how your approaches are rethinking to doing these events? Well, you know, I think COVID-19 has reshaped all of our lives. It has. For one, in our case, we, prior to COVID-19, had been geared more to the physical space, doing things face-to-face. -face. And we always had plans to get online and to start doing things there in a more meaningful way. But with COVID-19, we were left with no option but to hasten our steps towards the online. So what has come out of COVID-19 in a very real sense, and in a very good way, actually, mm -hmm. is that we have then quickly got up to speed with online and quickly put ourselves in a space where we can leverage that for good. And part of what we've done, for example, which we may speak about in another of these episodes, is that we have, for example, launched iNeutral, mm -hmm. which is an online dispute resolution platform, which is gearing to serve the needs of the globe, developed from within the region, relying on best practice from across the globe, and relying on the best skill sets that we could have found to ensure that we put something which is credible mm -hmm. and which has the capacity to deal with disputes as we see them across the board as an end-to-end -end process. The Honorable Delroy Chuck, QC MP, Minister of Justice in Jamaica, encouraged the novelty of this alternative dispute resolution platform, iNeutral. Here is a portion from what he had to say. I strongly believe that the alternative justice services is a major solution towards supporting the reduction of case backlog and daily heavy caseload in our courts. And also, to address the underlying social issues which give rise to tensions, conflicts, and crime in our communities. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past year, I have been encouraging our judges to refer applicable cases to ADR, such as restorative justice, mediation, and child diversion programs. Today's development is welcome and is a significant private sector-led step in the right direction. I believe iNeutral offers itself as an excellent complement to pathways to justice provided by the court system. Second, the niche to be developed by iNeutral is in sync with policy approach to the administration of justice which has been pursued by the Ministry of Justice. In closing, I'm especially proud to have learned that iNeutral has been developed by Jamaicans working in tandem with ADR and technology leaders from across the world. I intend to take the time out of my busy schedule to familiarize with iNeutral platform. I've been advised that the system is user-friendly and anyone, lawyer or not, technology savvy or not, can navigate it without difficulty. I highly commend the effort that has been made to develop and now implement iNeutral. And note that it could soon become a dispute resolution tool of choice in the public sector. You just heard the Minister of Justice, the Honorable Del Warchuk, endorsing iNeutral and speaking about the importance of access to justice in the digital age. 
In April 2020, one year before the introduction of iNeutral, Dr. Christopher Malcolm in a newspaper publication alluded to the fact that COVID-19 is a game changer. Global travel bans and restrictions have been implemented, and with them, incapacity or significant limitations on opportunities for physical meetings. With courts not at full operation, if at all, it must now be clear that litigation process is inadequate to serve the needs of the business community. iNeutral is a unique technological innovation in online dispute management with developed full-spectrum application capacity for dealing with domestic and international disputes. What iNeutral platform provides is third-party assisted dispute management options, including effective dispute resolution. iNeutral's domestic and international services include mediation, conciliation, facilitated contract renegotiation, adjudication, arbitration, and restorative justice. The iNeutral platform is easy to navigate and allows for secure end-to-end -end online completion from application to determination. Let's take a look at this unique innovation in online dispute management. Welcome, this is the homepage of the website. You can see it gives an overview of our services. Um, also gives an overview here of some of the features and standard features and optional features. Okay, so we're gonna go on up and we're gonna start the process from someone new that's just coming on the site. And let's just say they wanted to um, hit get started. They could go ahead and hit get started. And the first thing they would do, they would go ahead and register. Now for the demonstration purpose, purposes, I do have a demo button here. So we could just breeze and skip right through. So they'll go ahead and register. And after registration is completed, they will then be greeted with the dashboard. Now from this dashboard, they can go ahead and they can um, file a claim. They can view the previous claims that they filed before. They can reach out to support and they can see the history of uh, the claims that they submitted before. So let's go ahead and file a new claim. Here we can select a service that we're requesting, whether mediation, arbitration, whatever, whatever the services. We can select if it's a domestic or international matter. Uh, we can do uh, individual or corporate. You know, corporate will then you know ask for a company name. Individual, it will shift for you and just you know ask for the person's name and stuff, and you can um, enter all of that. All right, so let's go ahead and scroll on down. And they will go ahead and, and fill out all this, this information here, all right? Now here they can um, fill in a little bit of information about the dispute. They can type whatever they need and they could go ahead and upload any documents. And also if they have their documents on Dropbox or a Google Drive, they can put the URL here to whatever the, the service is, you know, whether it be like Dropbox or whatever service, whatever the URL is for the, um, the file that they want to send. Let's go ahead and proceed. So they'll, they'll submit that. And again, I'm, I'm just going to skip it through the demo button. And they'll receive a notification here, lets them know that the request has been submitted to the JIC. They will also receive an email confirmation with that. And now the JIC will be able to um, review all of the information that was submitted. So once all that is submitted, the JIC review and say, this is um, something that, you know, we're gonna move forward with. The JIC would reach out to the individual or the company, whoever submitted it, and say, okay, we're ready to get started. And let's see, let's move forward here. So once they're ready to get started, they're now able to select uh, the arbitrator. 
So these are some of the arbitrator that I have here, and they could select which one they, they, they wish to use. Um, they could also um, put in a request to use someone else. Um, they can also do that if they wish to use someone else. And all the parties will have to, you know, agree on who they want to use. So if we go ahead and select the first one here, we can see that this person is selected or voted because all the parties will have to agree. And once that is settled upon, we'll be able to move forward. And then this will bring us right into our, our claim. So this is where all the parties would, once the claim is started, they will enter here. And if they have multiple claims, they will see the multiple claims all listed here. So we'll go ahead and then we'll just enter one. And these are all the parties. So whoever is inside of this claim, they have access to it. So these two people here, they only have access to this unfair dismissal. These people over here, they only have access to this construction matter. Okay. The reason you're seeing multiple is because I'm in as an admin. If you were this person, you'll only be seeing this particular claim here. iNeutral provides online dispute management at your fingertips. Visit iNeutral.jaiac.org. That's iNeutral.jaiac.org. iNeutral dispute resolution made easy i hope you learned something from that thanks for the demonstration ryan let's get back to our conversation with dr christopher malcolm of course reminding you that you are listening or joining us for the jaiac's dispute management in a new world podcast series it's brought to you in association with the jdic protecting deposits for you and me JAIC has been online, but podcasting is a whole new gamma. Tell us why it is that you chose this form to bring across the messaging of dispute management. The fact is that, again, we are seeing a number of trends developing and seeing a number of ways in which people are getting their news mm -hmm. and getting stories being told. And we're in the business of telling stories. That is what we're doing right now. And we have found that a lot of people, both old and young, and particularly young, are now getting their news from podcasts in a way that they're not even getting from traditional news media. Mm -hmm. We also understood that our message is not simply a domestic message. It's an international one. And when we looked at it and we did our own research, and we considered what it is that we were hoping to do, it came to us and we recognized quite clearly that podcasting is one of the areas we should delve into. And this setting, of course, gives us this conversation setting, mm -hmm. gives us an opportunity to explore the issues a little deeper and to explore them in situations where we can speak about them at a level, hopefully, which we can properly get across to persons as to what we're trying to say. And we can do it in a way which has not just local but global impact. And we think as well that we have a unique story, but we don't want to keep it unique to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We want to ensure that as many as possible see what we're doing and are able to provide support and able to provide comments as well. Because the beauty about the podcasting and what we're doing is that we create an opportunity as they're, they're, they're there for persons to comment upon them, for persons to make their suggestions. And it re really allows us a greater value than any other mechanism I could think of at this time. Finally, Dr. Malcolm, the next episode in the series looks at the dispute management and the COVID-19 pandemic implications. Uh, is there a reason why we need to have this conversation um, for this next episode? Well, the first thing to bear in mind is that COVID-19 has not gone. It is still with us. The second thing is that even after we have got over it, we are going to have the implications continue for a long time. If we think, for example, back to, say, the US-Iran issues that arose years ago, there was a claims tribunal which 30-odd years after was still running mm -hmm. because the issues were still alive and well. The nature of law-related matters mean that you do not simply get a problem today, it manifests more, and it's the end of the day after. These things tend to have quite a long history. It's the same thing with courts. You can go to courts and you see matters in them for 
10, 50, 100 years even. The longest running cases that I'm aware of are cases involving in that Indo-Pakistan border issues related to that mm -hmm. are running for well over 100 years in court. You understand that there are generations of, of persons, land and related issues mm -hmm. that are there going on for substantial periods of time. And similarly, coming out of COVID, it may not necessarily be land related issues, but it could be business interruption and other matters that are there with long tails to them. So what we're saying here is that we understand that if we're looking at COVID, we can't simply be short-sighted enough to think that one day you're simply going to get up and all the issues related to it are gone. Mm -hmm. And in the context of dispute management, we have to do what we are able to do best, which is what we understand, which is dispute management, and understand that there are issues which are going to haunt us for a while. We need to plan for them properly, and we need to ensure that we understand what led to the problems in the first instance so that we can devise better solutions going forward. Because we already know that while COVID-19 has had this impact, it's not going to be the last thing of this nature that the world will have to deal with. So we must take stock, mm -hmm. learn the lessons that we can from it, and having learned those lessons, think of how it is that we can progressively put mechanisms in place that can help us deal with situations of this type better next time around. Thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm. And that was the conclusion of our two-part introduction to Dr. Christopher Malcolm and the great work that he is doing. We wrap up things with a repeat of today's quote. The world is a connected village. Cross-border engagement is unavoidable. Consequential disputes, conflicts in one sphere or another are inevitable and the public good is best served by enabled capacity in the field of disputes conflicts management please remember to tune into all of our podcast series episodes on dispute management in the new world available on buzzsprout podbean spreaker and the jaic's youtube channel until then i'm roxy nickel and I'm Annika Nelson reminding you that the podcast series that you just joined us for was brought to you by the JDIC, protecting deposits for you and me. On behalf of Dr. Christopher Malcolm, thank you for joining us. What words come to mind when you hear dispute management? Procedure, resolution process, tribunal, economic development. And what are some of the underlying industries that use dispute management? Construction, for instance, insurance, maritime, trade, investment, sports, and intellectual property are just a few. This program is produced with a kind sponsorship of the Jamaica Deposit Insurance Corporation, JDIC, protecting deposits for you and me. I save because one day my little business is going to be a big deal. Yeah, and I make sure to put away a little something for him. And thanks to JDIC, deposit insurance protection on my savings gone up. You've been upgraded. Deposits held in commercial banks, building societies, and merchant banks are covered under the JDIC deposit insurance scheme up to $1.2 million per depositor per institution. JDIC. Protecting deposits for you and me. Still ahead, the JAIAC's Dispute Management in a New World podcast series continues with bi-weekly episodes exploring the concept of dispute management, its appropriate use, options for stability in business relationships, and in support of sustainable economic development. We'll examine dispute management and technology, innovation and the changing global environment for dispute management, COVID-19 and its dispute resolution pandemic implications, financing development in emerging economies, policy investment and dispute resolution. Special thanks to ADEB Consultants Limited, consulting engineers practicing for over 40 years. iNeutral, dispute resolution made easy. CP Malcolm Dispute Management Practitioner, Caribbean Institute of Alternative Dispute Resolution Limited, CIADR, Mona Law Faculty, the University of the West Indies, Mona. Impact Justice, Improved Access to Justice in the Caribbean. Stay tuned to all our podcast episodes exploring the concept of dispute management, its appropriate use, options for stability in business relationships, and how it supports sustainable economic development. 
all our podcast episodes are distributed by these platforms. Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Deezer, Stitcher, Podcast Index, Pandora, TuneIn Plus Alexa, Podchaser, Podcast Addict, and wherever else you get your favorite podcasts.